together and you have to touch your wrong behaviour in it. Um, my name, for those of you who might have met um, a member of What's Up Tree, I'm the director of the Bitter Asia Institute. And on behalf of um, the Asia, the Australia Centre for uh, Asian Pacific Art, uh, the Queensland Art Gallery, uh, the Gallery of Modern Art, and indeed the British Asia Institute, uh, all those trees, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here uh, this evening. Um, for those of you who uh, attend Asia Perspectives uh, on a very regular basis will know that uh, we're now into our 11th year of the collaboration between the gallery and the Griffith and the, at the Institute in particular. Uh, it is for both sides, I think I'm right in saying this, a, a most rewarding uh, exercise in cooperation. The, the purposes of these meetings, as you know, is to, to bring to a, a public audience in Brisbane uh, issues that are of importance to Australia, but more widely to uh, the region uh, about Asia and the challenges that it confronts in relation to politics, economics, cultural issues, and it has been, I think, a, a very, very rewarding exercise. We've had a lot of uh, very stimulating discussions, as many of you who come regularly will know, and I don't think there's any question that it will be open to being uh, an equally stimulating uh, evening. So I, I welcome you here on behalf of uh, all of our collaborating partners. It's actually a great delight to see so many people in attendance uh, and in a, in, in a, uh, on an occasion which is, is, is slightly tragic, of course, uh, in the circumstances, but I think uh, without question a very important one for the, uh, the two countries, Australia and Indonesia. Um, before I go any further, I'd just like to acknowledge um, you are all distinguished guests, of course, uh, but I would like to take the opportunity to mention some, uh, some of our particular guests, uh, of course, in particular, uh, Chris Sames, the director of the galleries. Uh, Chris, thank you for coming along. It's a great delight to see you uh, here this evening. Um, the uh, police commissioner, uh, Ian Stewart, has come along. He seems to think this is very relevant to his uh, activity, and, and we're delighted to see you here, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Matabe, the, the new, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't met him, the new deputy consul for the Consulate General of Japan in Brisbane here, who's only been in the country about you know, a couple of weeks, or perhaps a month or so. Matabe <laughs> Sun, it's good to see you here. And uh, Captain Kaiper, the honorary consul for the Consulate General of the Netherlands, uh, is also in attendance. Uh, those of you who have been uh, loitering, as it were, uh, in, the, in the foyer will have heard the, the strains of the Griffith uh, Conservatorium uh, Ensemble that is there, and uh, they come regularly, and of course it's a great delight to, to have them. I think um, the, the guitar ensemble is, is how it was described to me. Um, Griffiths, uh, thank you for being back. Uh, Griffiths, Vice-Chancellor Ian uh, Connock, who sometimes comes, but he's asked me to give his apologies uh, for this evening. He's uh, been paying elsewhere. Um, let's move to the the matter at hand. I was in uh, Indonesia uh, just a week, ten days ago, uh, and uh, an article caught my attention in the Jakarta Post. That's the English language, one of the main English language newspapers in Jakarta. Uh, it was an op-ed piece uh, which uh, arrested me. Uh, it had the heading, Australia lacks cultural competence to understand R.I. and the public of Indonesia. Um, and the first sentence uh, focused my attention on what the author thought to be a serious problem in the state of Australia-Indonesia relations, and more particularly a weakness in Australia's particular comprehension of the challenges trying to understand Indonesia. Uh, it began... Canberra really needs to contemplate whether it has the sufficient intellectual and cultural competence to understand, communicate and respectfully engage with Indonesian sensibilities and preferences on a wide range of international issues. And that's challenging enough, I think, for an Australian. I'm reading it. It may not be too far from the truth and, and 
you may well uh, say something on that uh, this evening. And then I went on to say, at least recognising this point, the issue is important because it carries significant implications for Australia's future dealings with Indonesia in particular and Asia in general. And, and the tone you can find it, the article online, I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested in, in pursuing it. Um, but of course, it's a reflection of the serious challenges that exist in this bilateral relationship. It's a relationship, of course, which we've had for uh, 50, 60 odd plus years, uh, and yet seems not to be at one level uh, a very stable relationship. It can be seemingly so easily upset by events and developments, and often these events and developments occur at a time which um, perhaps on both sides there's a there's a little there's a little expectation of the uh, the likelihood that the relationship will be so uh, in jeopardy. Uh, a former uh, foreign minister, Gareth Evans, once observed that the, the difficulty in the Australian Indonesia relationship was that it lacked ballast, and he was probably referring to the state of the economic relationship, which sadly has not expanded significantly uh, during that period of time, particularly relative to the way in which our relationship with China, for example, or Japan, has grown over this period of time. Uh, but it lacks ballast in other ways, I think, and, and I'm sure that will be part of our theme this evening. Um, it is uh, difficult for me to think of another person who is more appropriate to uh, address us on these themes uh, this evening. Tim Lindsay formally is the Malcolm Smith Professor of Asian Law and Director of the Centre for Indonesian Law, Islam and Society at the Law School at Melbourne University. Um, those of you who are interested in his formalities and further about his achievements can uh, look at it online, I'm sure. Um, I think all we need to know is that, uh, in my view, Tim Lindsay is one of Australia's foremost Indonesianists. His specialty, of course, is law, but Tim's knowledge and understanding of Indonesia, um, which is informed by many years of experience, uh, a great deal of study, many, many, many trips to Indonesia, uh, is informed in a way which um, is, uh, is, it is a great national asset, I think you could say in relation to, isn't that right, Tim? Uh, <laughs> Tim is a great national asset in relation to Indonesia. Uh, he's my friend, and it is a particular delight to welcome you here this evening. And Tim, uh, we look forward to your remarks, um, after which I think we'll have a Q&A, and I'm sure we'll have a very lively session. But it's a great pleasure to welcome you here uh, this evening. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all. Could you, could you join with me in welcoming Tim Lindsay? Thank you very much, uh, and thank you so much for joining me tonight. Um, in my university, usually these seminars are accompanied by cordial and a couple of biscuits, if you're lucky, so uh, I'm overwhelmed by the spectacular reception provided tonight by the two chairs. Griffith and the gallery, it's a, a tremendous relationship and it's a credit to both institutions and it's a great pleasure to be part of it tonight. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Australia and Indonesia will always have tensions in their relationship. All neighbouring countries do to some extent for a range of fairly obvious reasons. Obviously, cultural, historical, political and economic differences matter, but so too do shared borders, movements of people across them both citizens and non-citizens, regular and irregular. This has always driven, been driven by regional conflicts, but it is increasing with globalisation. Whatever the reason, however, tensions between neighbours mark the history of most countries with shared borders. Think of the United States and Mexico, for example, or anywhere really in Europe, for that matter. The history of Europe is really essentially a history of border conflicts. These issues have particular weight in the case of Australia and Indonesia because there are very few neighbouring countries, perhaps none, with such marked differences. Race, ethnicity, language, majority religion, economy, geography, demography, history, all are extraordinarily different. 
so too I might add uh, the legal systems that I have a particular area of interest the European French Dutch system in Indonesia um, or the French Dutch derived system and the British derived legal system here in Australia likewise while most both countries are democracies Indonesia's current system is more like the United States model than our Westminster model and it is in any case being just a little over 10 years old widely misunderstood in Australia. In fact, Australia and Indonesia are the international odd couple. It is therefore not surprising that we have tensions and occasional crises in the bilateral relationship with Indonesia. Indeed, it would be very surprising if it were otherwise. A former Australian ambassador to Indonesia always used to say that Australia enjoys a perfect relationship with Iceland. The test of the relationship between Australia and Indonesia is, however, not where the problems arise, but how they are handled. And unfortunately, tensions between Australia and Indonesia are often very difficult to manage because they are extraordinarily prone to very rapid escalation. And this is true despite bipartisan agreement in Canberra that the relationship with Indonesia is an absolutely vital one for Australia's future. Unlike any other country, including Indonesia, we have only one significant, large and powerful near neighbour, and it is rising very fast, as well we'll show later. Not only is it rising fast, but it is increasingly asserting its size and regional clout. This tendency to rapid escalation of tensions between our two countries is largely because the Australian public is generally hostile and extremely ill-informed about Indonesia. And this is true, notwithstanding the fact that more than one in five Australians have been to Indonesia, albeit usually only to Bali. Despite the calls to boycott Bali that we've heard, Australians still constitute around about 25% of quota of all visitors to Bali. In fact, it increased by 16.74% in January and February this year alone. The total in that period, by the way, was 156,000 plus. I don't think Boycott Bali is going to happen. That's because the visits to Bali, the Australian tourist presence <coughs> in that one province of Indonesia, seems to operate without any connection to the broader relationship between Australia and Indonesia. <coughs> the Australia Bali relationship seems to occur, in fact, in a sort of cognitive vacuum, usually powered by beer parties and massages, as Victor and Ronda know all too well. This means that although more and more Australians are visiting Bali, regardless of what happens in Indonesia, attitudes towards Indonesia have at the same time ironically deteriorated markedly since democratisation and liberalisation began in 1998, and polls from a wide range of polling agencies, the Lowy, Crosby, Texter, Morgan, and so on, VFAT's own polls, are all absolutely consistent on this, that Australian attitudes towards Indonesia are more negative than they were under the authoritarian rule of Supato, and have consistently become worse each year during that period. There might have been a little flattening out last year, but other than that, it's been a consistent downward trend. One of the main reasons for this is the perfect storm of bad news events since 1998, which have dominated our media presentations of Indonesia, as you'd expect, and which have severely skewed perceptions. And I refer here, of course, to the Bali bombings, one and two, the Marriott Hotel and Embassy bombings, the avian flu, SARS, the, of course, the tsunami, a slew of earthquakes, people smugglers, beef cattle, tourist deaths, Australian drugs offenders, including Corby, the Bali Boy, the Bali Nine, and of course more recently the tragic killings of Sukumaran and Chan. I often say to my students that if you dropped Indonesia onto a map of Europe, it would run from Moscow to Cloister, Dublin. And if you recorded that section of the world as a single slab, you probably heard a similar landslide of bad news stories as well. But whatever the accidents of geography, the fact is that is how Indonesia is consistently presented on our screens. And of course, it doesn't help here that Indonesian studies is in decline, probably terminal decline, on track to ex 
distinction in our schools and universities sometime in the next eight years. In other words, we have uh, not just a perfect storm of bad news events, but a perfect storm of bad news events and declining enrolment in religion studies, which means that ignorance drives a decline in religion studies, which drives ignorance, and so we have a downward spiral. And again, the data on that is absolutely clear, but are there some significant shifts? Indonesian studies will end in our schools sometime in the next eight years, and probably within four years of that within our universities as well. In any case, whatever the reasons, the result is a deep misunderstanding in Australia about Indonesia in the form of what former President Susilo Belmanguerillono rightly called preposterous caricatures. To give just a few of these preposterous caricatures, first, most Australians have missed entirely Indonesia's spectacular democratisation in the post sinatra period, according to the polls. Second, many of them, again according to the polls, think Indonesia is ruled by the army, when of course the army was pushed back into the barracks in the years following Suharto's fall. Thirdly, many Australians think Indonesia sympathises and supports Islamic extremism, when on the contrary, Indonesia, um, being a majority Muslim country, is naturally more threatened by it than is Australia, and every single administration in Indonesia has been directly threatened by it. Fourth, um, many Australians rate Indonesia more negatively than any other country on earth in terms of threat, with the exception only of, I should refer to one particular poll, North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, and oddly, Saudi Arabia. <coughs> now, the key to this problem, I'm sorry, the key to the difficulty of managing the bilateral relationship is that this yawning gap between government-to-government -government enthusiasm for the bilateral relationship and public hostility in Australia creates an inherent fragility in the relationship. Because there is little public support for good relations with Indonesia, politicians often respond to tensions in ways that are contrary to their own better judgment and knowledge about the relationship. In other words, they know the relationship matters a great deal for Australia's future, but they rapidly compromise on that when talkback radio gets the bit between its teeth, as seems to be the case, for example, when the Prime Minister made his unfortunate remark retrospectively linking aid for the tsunami to uh, treatment of Australians in the Indonesian legal system. And afterwards, they face the task of reconstructing relations, and it's Groundhog Day once again for Canberra and Jakarta. This is a cycle that seems to be repeated over and over and over again. The rhetoric about how important the relationship is to the crisis, the talkback radio hysteria, the uh, political response, judge to respond to the talkback radio, the escalating crisis, and then the period of rebuilding. In other words, the bilateral relationship with Indonesia is extremely vulnerable to attitudes in Australia and is seen as expendable. The same is unfortunately also true, of course, for Indonesian attitudes to Australia, perhaps to a lesser extent. Indonesian attitudes or knowledge about Australia is equally ill-informed, although generally less hostile, according to polling conducted recently in Indonesia. Indonesians, for example, are open and positive about investment from Australia, but most believe that Australia wants to control Eastern Indonesia as near the colonial ambitions, particularly in relation to Papua New Guinea, but the Christian Eastern Indonesia as well. This is a widely held view. That, of course, makes Papua a particularly sensitive flashpoint for crisis in the bilateral relationship. to instability in the relationship between Australia and Indonesia is the lingering influence of the Suharto era on how we view bilateral tensions. Under an authoritarian leader, the bilateral relationship was both much easier and much less resilient. It was heavily contingent on Suharto's personal views. And that meant that our perceptions of the bilateral relationship were narrowly focused on the personality of the president and his inner circle. post Suharto Indonesia is a very different place. Its politics now involve a much more diverse group. But the 
much more diverse range of interest groups. It's no longer just about the palace in Jakarta. Similarly, the linkages between the two countries are also now much more diffuse and complex, particularly at the civil society level. Civil society links between Australia and Indonesia are increasingly significant. And this has created a wider foundation for the relationship and gives it more resilience than was the case under Suharto, but it also creates many new sources of potential difficulty. And it remains the case that despite all of this, and despite the fact that the post Suharto presidency is now politically and constitutionally much, much weaker, both countries still focus heavily on the presidency as the key barometer of the health of the bilateral relationship. This was certainly true, still true after, I'm sorry, this was true during the 10 years of President Susilo Bambadi Yudhoyono's rule. The Yudhoyono era bolted our expectations of the relationship at the government-to-government level. After the low point reached following the Australian intervention in Timor-Leste in 1999, Yudhoyono's presidency greatly raised expectations of how the bilateral relationship could be managed. And there were five key factors contributing to this. First, his own personal warmth for Australia, which was significant, if occasionally inexplicable. Secondly, his foreign policy emphasis on Indonesia's international standing, his stated policy of hundreds of friends and zero enemies, with an accompanying strong concern that Indonesia be seen as a liberal democracy and a good international citizen on the world stage. Third, his relatively secure position politically. He usually had the numbers in Indonesia's legislature and often cho chose to rein in some of the more aggressive critics of Australia in the cabinet circles. He was, in fact, far more effective at doing this than he usually give him credit for. Four, some effective and strategic moves on the part of Australian governments. The tsunami aid, more to Australia for Yudhoyono, his address to the joint houses of parliament, uh, an enormous number of ministerial visits, and so on. And finally, I think the very positive impact of Australia's aid program in Indonesia, including its huge scholarship program, which is the largest foreign scholarship program in Indonesia, should not be overlooked. As a result, the standard Department of Foreign Affairs account of the bilateral relationship during the Yudhoyono's rule was that it was as good as it gets. Indonesia was described as Australia's best friend in the region. There was a high level of confidence, hugely increased interactions at all levels, government and non-government, across a wide range of organisations and agencies. And this was true despite inevitable tensions, for example, when Indonesian ambassadors were withdrawn, one, in one case over the entry to Australia of Papua and asylum seekers. And of course, the Snowden wiretap leaks crisis, the worst moment for the bilateral relationship under Yudhoyono, because it involved him personally and was seen by him more than anything else as a direct insult, humiliating him publicly after he had, as he saw it, gone out on a limb for Australia. Hence, the aggression of his, in his response. These tensions were ultimately managed in a fairly predictable fashion. For example, the end, before Yudhoyono left office, the end of the suspension of military intelligence and people smuggling cooperation imposed by Indonesia was always expected and considered inevitable by both sides. It happened last year with the signing of a new roadmap for cooperation. Because it was understood that it would happen and expected, this meant that in reality, cooperation always continued at the agency to agency level, even when it was formally suspended, particularly in relation to uh, security and people smuggling. In this context, one of the major problems for the bilateral relationship today is simply that the new president, Joko Widodo, is not Yudhoyono, and Australia really doesn't know how to handle that. The expectations in the limited year that the Yudhoyono government's handling of the bilateral relationship would be the standard approach. We got used to SBY's keen interest in Indonesia's international reputation, his ability to resist domestic critics when he wanted to, his generally professional, timid, and exceptionally able foreign minister. The assumption was that this was the new normal in the bilateral relationship, and so there is now an 
Australia, at least in government, a sense of confusion, disappointment, even shock that the same predictability and level of access doesn't exist under Jokowi, as is known so far. It may, in fact, now never be achieved. Living Jokowi will be tainted with Australian eyes for a long time to come as a result of the recent killings of Lauren Sukumaran and Edward Chan. In fact, the Australian recalibration to post Yuliana Indonesia is proving very difficult. Jokowi's administration is very different to Yuliana's. He is politically still very weak. He lacks the numbers in the legislature that Yuliana always enjoyed. Although this may well change before the end of the year. Jokowi is politically inexperienced in dealing with the Jakarta elite. I think almost anybody who wasn't born into it would be inexperienced in dealing with these semi Maguire sharks. Again, however, this may change. He has a serious lack of diversity and experience in his own inner circle of advisors. It is proving very hard for those outside that tiny and shrinking inner circle to access Jokowi, even for the Indonesian civil society leaders he knew him well, also they did before the election. He has become encircled by a small number of extraordinarily powerful elite figures, in particular former President Megawati Sukarno Putri, the media tycoon Surya Kono, and the former intelligence mogul Hendro Kiyono. Jokowi is in fact embroiled in a massive political struggle with Megawati, who is his party chair. She sees him as a party functionary, not an independent president, and has sought with some success to exercise a de facto veto on decisions. Jokowi has in fact so far failed most major political tests uh, short of reducing subsidies for fuel. Uh, these include in particular his inability to defend the highly regarded anti-corruption commission and that may well lose him vital support from civil society. It's vital because he lacks elite support and so looks to public mass endorsement using civil society as the vehicle to reach the public. Civil society in Indonesia is in fact in a state of panic about their president. They are conflicted about whether to support him or continue supporting him or abandon him over the, his failure to support the attacks on the Anti-Corruption Commission by a sort of clique of <coughs> corrupt police and corrupt politicians. He also suffers from an inexperienced and unprofessional cabinet which is divided and has let him down repeatedly. There are great tensions within that cabinet, not just between ministers but between some of the ministers and Jokowi because they are answerable more to their patrons, Surya Paro or Megawati and others than they are to him. As a result, the Jokowi administration in general seems clumsy, unpredictable, difficult to access and generally uninterested in Australia. This, of course, all applies to foreign policy for a number of reasons. With Jokowi struggling in a whirlpool of domestic politics, foreign policy is simply not the priority it was for Yuliana. It is, as Greg Philly has said, an abstraction. Jokowi is an amateur politician with provincial conservative values. He stands for small business, family values, assistance for the poor. Mr Smith goes to Washington. It's very true in this context. He may perhaps have been misread as also being a human rights supporter, a liberal reformer. So far, those two things haven't formed much part of his administration. Jokowi is inwardly focused. He has little interest or exposure to foreign policy. His foreign minister, Ratna Marsudi, is a technocrat and not a strong voice in cabinet. She's finding her way. She may become more influential later, but we should keep in mind that she has bad memories of her time in Australia previously at the time of the Dili massacre. In any case, Indonesian foreign policy usually tends to look north to the Southeast Asian region of Indonesia expects to dominate, or further afield to China, the US, the Middle East. Indonesia rarely looks back to the south. Rightly or wrongly, there is also a growing consensus among the Jakarta elite that Indonesia is now the senior partner in the bilateral relationship with Australia and Australia needs to give reasons why it should be given attention. Indonesia's leadership is aware that despite their best efforts, Indonesia is on track to become an economic giant of global significance. Rating agencies say Indonesia will be top 10 in 15 years. Thus, the Indonesian economy will be in the top 10 in 15 years. Its economy is predicted to be big, bigger than Germany and the UK in the top five by 2050, along with China, India, Russia, and the US. Now, there's three different rating agencies claim this. Whether you agree or not, it seems clear that Indonesia will be 
saw we shape our own region. We will be the poor cousins of a gigantic country next door with a population heading towards half a billion and a world-scale economy. At the moment, we are only about the 11th largest trading partner. We invest twice as much in Papua New Guinea than we do in Indonesia. We also invest far more in New Zealand than in Indonesia. It is therefore somewhat ironic that Indonesians say an apology to any New Zealanders present. Indonesians often will tell you that you, Australia, are to us, Indonesia, as New Zealand is to you. That was not a great response. <laughs> Too many New Zealanders in the audience. Many Australian commenta commentators have been begun pointing to a perception that Australia already lacks linkage with Indonesia, and in particular with Jokowi, who in recent weeks refused to even take telephone calls from our Prime Minister and Prime Minister. This is a trend that is unlikely to reverse without some very significant change. In other words, if the relationship does sour, Indonesia will not be particularly worried. It is unlikely to be proactive in seeking to repair the relationship because it's not greatly important to it. Rightly or wrongly, that will be up to us. All this is complicated by the fact that the nationalist and sovereignty rhetoric that dominated the election campaign Jokowi won against former General Prabowo continues to resonate in Indonesia, as seen, for example, in unprecedented, unprecedented attempts by Indonesia and more actually in um, efforts that were successful to sink illegal fishing ships, for example, from Vietnam. This nationalist rhetoric greatly complicates foreign relations. One example is Indonesia's decision now to start pushing back boats uh, containing Rohingya refugees from Myanmar and elsewhere. We're entered into a ping-pong situation where Malaysia, Thailand and Indonesia push back boats, no one accepting them. Some boats are now being on the ocean for months. For the last 10 years, Indonesia repeatedly called for a regional multilateral solution to refugees in the region. Australia insisted on a unilateral approach in the face of strong opposition from Indonesia. Now Indonesia has given up and decided to act unilaterally as well. That constitutes a repudiation of Australia. No one should underestimate the possibility for a direct bilateral conflict. Watch this space. The result of all this is that managing the bilateral relationship is now much more difficult than it has been for many years. And Australia has already spent a great deal of political capital decreeing under Yuliano and dealing with the Snowden phone tap revelations, people smuggling, and now the executions of Superman and Chan. Australia must, however, mal be that mal, rise to the challenge of keeping good relations with Indonesia, regardless of how difficult or, at times, unfair it may seem. Imagine how bad things could get if we did not. Indonesia straddles our vital principal air and sea lanes to the north. Indonesia mediates our access to Southeast Asian regional formal forums and diplomacy. Indonesia is, in strategic terms, the key to our northern defence and controls the vital deep sea naval access points in the Lombok and Makassar Straits. Indonesia, like it or not, will soon be a major economic power. Let me now close with a brief assessment of the likely impact on the bilateral relationship of the recent executions. Australia's chief concerns were not in fact about Jokowi or foreign policy or the bilateral relationship with Indonesia or even drugs policy or the slow pace, pace of law reform in Indonesia. Australia's chief concerns were and are squarely about the death penalty. This is a point of principle on which Australia has a strong policy history and public commitment that was confirmed by federal legislation recently. And Australia has had very similar reactions to the execution of Australians in other countries in the recent past in Singapore and Malaysia. In Indonesia, however, the issue was squarely about drugs policy and the political standing of President Joko Widodo. This means the two countries were largely talking past each other during the recent crisis. Prime Minister Abbott's LinkedIn clemency for the two men to Australia's post-tsunami aid, implying some sort of retrospective obligation on Indonesia's part not to execute them, was a major mistake. Aid conditionality is historically closely linked in Indonesia with that dangerous flashpoint idea of national sovereignty in the sense of independence from perceived prior manipulation. 
it goes back to con conflicts about Dutch aid in the past or more recently IMF letters of conditionality. It is a very explosive issue. The Prime Minister's comments made this the other focus of the argument in Indonesia and the human rights issues about the death penalty rapidly were lost in increasingly angry backlashes points to Australia. This probably doomed the intense, remarkable and commendable efforts made by the Department of Foreign Affairs to try and save the two men. For progress to be made in the future, opposition of the death penalty needs to be detached from other bilateral relationship issues. Australia is only one of many countries with citizens on death row in Indonesia. There are Europeans and many Africans too. The European Union is a major trading partner for Indonesia, unlike Australia, and the UN supports abolition too. We have citizens facing execution in other Asian countries. Indonesia has even more than we do across Asia, facing death, and it has spent a great deal of money and effort to save their lives. Obviously, we could work together in that regard to save the citizens of the two countries on death row in other countries. It is a point of commonality in the midst of this tragic mess. Withdrawing our ambassador after the executions was an appropriate step given Brazil and Netherlands did the same after their nationals are executed. It was a symbolic gesture, however, it will have little lasting concrete effect. Justice has been the case when Indonesia withdrew and then returned its ambassador to Australia in the past. But we must now resist the temptation to further reprisals as Indonesia would certainly retaliate. We must avoid escalating tit for tat measures because in that particular game of poker we were all winners. It remains to be seen if Indonesia interprets the 40 percent cut to our aid budget to Indonesia in the recent budget as a form of sanction that decides to retaliate. So far it looks like it will not do so. What should we do? Instead, we should be taking further action at the multilateral level with other countries with citizens on death row in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, as well as with international organisations. We should be clearly focused on Australia's position in principle against the death penalty, but not on sanctions and not on aid programs. We should not confuse our position on the death penalty with bilateral issues, including aid, for example. Posu out of Indonesia has always placed much rhetorical emphasis on multilateral approaches and not unilateral ones. Why not take this at face value? It has worked in the past, for example, the development of APEC, or the United International Response to Jamaat Islamia and terrorism in Indonesia, to give two examples. And if I can just get the indulgence uh, of the chair, my last point is the other step that does need to be taken is a bilateral one, but it is also a very difficult one. We must work to develop a better framework for international bilateral cooperation with Indonesia on criminal justice. Extradition, prisoner exchanges, protocols for parole, prison reform, etc. None of these are working. All of these points of controversy all add to the difficulties between the relationship. They are all sore points. We need much better coordination on criminal justice urgently. It is so often at the heart of recent tensions between the two countries. Think again of Corby, the barley boy, the barley mine, underage people, smuggling crews, illegal fishers, and so it goes on and on. There can be no doubt that to return to a point I made at the start of this presentation, Australians will again, in the future, find themselves in the criminal justice system just as more Indonesians will certainly find themselves in our courts and jails. A better framework for cooperation on bilateral criminal justice issues would help the citizens of both countries in the future, and it would relieve much of the tension on the bilateral relationship. It is technically extremely difficult and will need far better resourcing and political support than has been given to, to date. It remains to be seen whether our government or the government of Indonesia has any real enthusiasm for this sort of task. I expect the liberal-minded, human rights-oriented Indonesian Minister for Law and Justice, Laoli, might be a good place to start. But wherever we start, whatever the stage of the relationship, we must fix some of the underlying irritants, and the criminal justice system is a very good place to start. Thank you.